Um, can each of you just give us a quick summary, you know, the cliff notes of your work to just sort of help the stage, set the stage for this discussion. Um, Sarah, would you like to kick us off? Sure, thank you. It's great to be here with all of you. I'm Sarah Charlotte Powers. I'm the co-founder and executive director of a New York City-based organization called the Natural Areas Conservancy. We work to elevate the care of the 1.7 million acres of urban parkland that is natural habitats across the city. So we work in places, do we have a, mostly New Yorkers here? Yeah, great. So we work in places like Jamaica Bay, um, Pelham Bay Park, and Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx. We do take the principles of forest restoration and management and wetlands ecology and apply them in the urban context to improve the health of natural habitats and to invite people into these places through a series of innovative approaches. Thank you. Yeah. Pooja, how about you? Um, I'm Pooja Choksi and I co-founded a research collaboration that essentially leverages the power of acoustic technology uh, to sort of monitor restoration and conservation efforts. It's largely in India, which is where most of my doctoral research has happened. Um, and when I'm not listening to forests, uh, I'm still studying them. I, um, I essentially study what happens when we try to restore a piece of land. So what happens to biodiversity? What happens to people living around it? And then I also try and understand why certain projects, restoration projects especially, um, you know, meet their goals and some just go off track and, and what are the conditions that help make that happen so that we can take all that knowledge and, and put it into to really meeting our restoration targets. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Tilly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Tilly Walton and I'm grateful to be in this room with everybody who cares about the planet. Uh, my journey started as a, a career guiding whitewater trips in the Grand Canyon and other rivers around the world. And that led me to be interested in um, environmental science. So I have a, a BS in hydrology and um, my master's in environmental ma management and planning focused on river restoration. And I've worn many hats, um, one of which was um, philanthropy at a major foundation and have helped start programs uh, doing job creation and river restoration, and then I've also been involved as an environmental consultant um, in a lot of on-the-ground work, um, including uh, from you know digging soil and uh, doing all the science studies to the stakeholder consensus building, to the planning, to implementation and monitoring. And from my career as a guide, I found that when people are connected um, to the planet, then they connect to themselves. And once people are connected, they care. And so that's led me to be, to wonder how can I connect more people? And so that led to hosting this PBS uh, adventure documentary series where it's an unscripted adventure on rivers in the Southwest and around the world. So um, yeah, I just figure the more connected we all are, the more we care. Well said. Uh, so I kind of want to pick up on some of the threads of our conversation with Carl right at the end there. We were getting um, into technology a little bit. And I know each of you has been a researcher at some point. Um, Pooja, I'm looking at you, still so quite active in that space. So I'm sort of curious how you see the role of technology and data in restoration. Obviously, it's, it's a huge piece of Project Vani. But can you just tell us what you think about you know, kind of the, the forward future looking view of what that means? Um, so, the biggest reason I co-founded Project Dwani with other scientists is because I really think um, we're going to need technology, uh, essentially just remote sensing tools, to be able to monitor all of these efforts. Um, they're huge, they cost so much money, um, and we really need to know what's going on. Um, and we can't do that always uh, with just human effort alone. So I, I, I definitely think it's, it's where we're headed mm -hmm. if we want to take this to scale. Um, that said, uh, I, I think that some technology is at a mature stage. For example, 
um, spatial, sort of spatial technology, remote sensing tools. Uh, we've got LIDAR. We can understand which species is where just based on LIDAR data, for example. But some technology, the, the one that I sort of rely on the most, acoustic technology, is getting there, but it's at a very nascent stage right now where we're still trying to understand what is the ecological meaning of the way a forest sounds. How do we correlate um, what we're hearing to what a healthy, quote unquote, healthy forest is like? Because you can define a healthy forest in many different ways, and you can define degradation in many different ways. Um, so it's not like you can say, uh, uh, an unhealthy forest sounds like X, and a healthy one sounds like Y. It's really complex. Um, so we're still at the stage where we're trying to understand the science behind the sounds. Um, but that said, again, there's a lot of work happening on the back end at this point, and I think in the next few decades, it probably will be where remote sensing is now, where we can't do without it at all. So, so I'm very hopeful. Great, thanks. I just want to shift a little bit to, um, you know, our, our session is on connecting people and planets. So let's talk about the, the social element of this. Um, you know, how do you define a community? Even there's, you know, I think we've had this conversation um, on our prep calls, but it's just fascinating. Each of you are working in such different regions. Community means a different thing to each of you. So how do you approach that in your work? And how do each of you see um, you know, co-benefits, identifying co-benefits for each of the particular communities that you're serving and working in. Sarah, I'll start with you. Sure. <clears throat> well, I'll actually pick up on the sort of data theme and then sort of segue into talking about community. Um, two pieces of data that have actually informed how we think about communities, um, using New York City as an example. The first piece of data is a piece of ecological data, which is that we have over 7,000 acres of intact woodlands within the five boroughs, which is really surprising to many New Yorkers. Um, those forest areas have 85% native canopy, which is similar to places like the Adirondacks. So we have these ecological communities that are much healthier than most people, including people who work within our city, um, anticipate. And then we pair that with social data, which shows that 50% of New York City residents have never experienced nature outside of their city park system. So we married together what we know about the benefit of spending time in nature, having access not just to traditional sort of recreational park space, but to awe-inspiring natural spaces and beauty. And we think about the communities that are served and not served by these urban oases and how we can connect um, those communities more wholly and how we can shift management through things like workforce development and employing local people in the care of our natural spaces, creating um, robust networks of trails and access in parts of our city that have not traditionally had that kind of invitation into nature. And we do, in our case, we do a lot of that work in very close, um, sort of slow-moving collaboration, a lot of time spent in communities, in schools, in um, you know, community meetings, really getting to know the needs and desires of the residents, and then really taking the technical knowledge and expertise that we have and bringing that into this collaborative spirit to really elevate both the communities that we're working with and the places that we want to make more inviting for them. Um, Pooja, go ahead. Uh, so I think I, I've, I've had a similar approach to Sarah. Um, so to be clear, I've not, I'm not on the implementation side. I'm more on the research side. But you know, based on what I've seen um, working, researching restoration projects, um, one, I think we use the word local community a lot. Uh, but really, it's just a group of very different people Put together. So, for example, most of my research happens in central India, and you can have a village as small as uh, one of 50 households. Each of those 50 households wants something different, and they have completely different aspirations. Um, so, I would think uh, uh, when we say community, we're still dealing with uh, wildly varied aspirations, um, even within a small group. Um, and, and I think that 
brings me to, um, to, to the point of, of using different approaches to meet the needs of people. Uh, so for example, uh, even though this, is, this panel is about restoration, uh, when you think out of the box, um, you're going to end up reaching your destination as well. So a simple example, some of the research I was involved in um, a, a few years ago, uh, we found that we actually found that um, forests sort of grew back, or sort of re were restored, um, thanks to an energy and housing policy uh, that was introduced a few years ago. Um, and so no one expected that to be the result. The point, or, the point of those economic policies was, was human well-being, but it ended up having um, an effect of reducing degradation. So I think you know, we're, we're dealing with so many different aspirations that we really need to think out of the box uh, and this is clearly a room of creative people who, who are here to find a solution. So I think, um, yeah, just think out of the box. And, and I think people will be much happier with that. Great, thanks. Tilly, what does community mean in the context of your work? Well, I think I'll go back to something that Carl said about the benefit being that we have a planet that we can live on. Yeah. And so I guess I would take the scope of, you know, this is Team Earth. And so we're all... We're all here, and, and community, just like Sarah said, with the biodiversity, you know, what makes um, a healthy community in nature is a lot of diversity. And I think also uh, what makes a healthy community in terms of our restoration projects is also including a broad, diverse group of people, um, like Pooja said, to, that, you know, have these different interests. And for me, what I've seen in the work I've done is that at least in terms of water, water is a common thread that binds us all together, and we can't live without it. You know, it's our power, it's our food, it's, it's what, you know, you can go three weeks without food, but three days without water. And so I think community, to me, is pulling in all the diverse voices, but then finding the common thread through it. Yeah, and I kind of want to pick up off, off of that point and point out that you work in the American West quite a bit, which, um, this country is obviously divided on many things, but particularly in that region, I mean, land use issues, um, you know, political opinions on environmental issues. So how do you sort of grapple that, you know, if there's people that really, you know, aren't on board with, you know, these types of projects, or there's tension with, you know, between different you know, stakeholders in this, how have you dealt with that? Well, a, a number of ways, like an example, when we worked, we did a big project outside of Yuma, Arizona, which was a large scale restoration. And we had, uh, you know, we had the tribes and we had the local city government. We had very conservative farmers. We had very left leaning environmentalists and we had the economic development um, group from the city and everybody had a different point of view. And so one thing that I think is key is listening to people because most people just want to be heard. And then the other thing is creating community. So creating these stakeholder consensus building groups where you provide pizza, you get rid of barriers to entry. So you can include everybody. So you have pizza, you have childcare, and then you listen, and then you write down everybody's ideas. But the other thing I've seen is in, um, talking with people for the show is I'll go to a very, very conservative rancher and talk to him about water. And then I'll go and I'll talk to a very liberal leaning, say tribal leader or environmentalist. And what it is, is everybody's actually saying the same thing. They're just using different language, so. Mm. It's fascinating. And I will say uh, pizza and childcare gets very far in my book as yes. well. So, <laughs> just everybody's book, right? Right? Like who doesn't love that? And a planet to live on. Yes. What more could you want? <laughs> um, Sarah, I kind of want to go to you. Um, you know, we talk often about how vulnerable populations are, you know, disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change. I'm wondering how that plays out here in New York City in an urban environment, and how does that factor into your approaches on these projects? Sure, um, it's a great question, and it's you know for us. Yeah, we it's could be here all day. One right? of the most pressing <laughs> topics. Um, a couple of years ago, extreme heat um, lapped other forms of weather-related um, death and human health. 
um, implications to become the leading cause of climate-related mortality in our country. And that's particularly, um, particularly hits hard in urban areas where people live really close together and the urban heat island, which is the phenomena where cities heat up in really hot days and don't have the capacity to cool down at night because there's so much built infrastructure that holds onto heat even as the ambient temperature begins to cool. Um, that has become a real focus, not just for us in our work, but for many folks working in the urban space around the country. And so we are really um, interested in kind of thinking about that in two different ways. One is proactively taking the approaches that we know do work, like planting as a complement to things like changing building infrastructure, adding air conditioning, um, but also conducting new research. It's kind of amazing how there's these big information gaps, even in a sort of policy landscape where you sort of think you know everything. So last summer, for the first time, we conducted research across 12 US cities looking at the heat gradient, not just from the sort of unshaded environment into shaded neighborhoods, which there's tons and tons of research on that topic, but all the way into the interior of natural parkland to really understand not just, you know, is it better to have a tree in front of your house, which Spoiler, it's definitely better to have a tree in front of your house <laughs> on a really hot day. Um, but we are just beginning to understand the sort of um, neighborhood scale air conditioning effects of having larger oases of natural space adjacent to the built environment. The ability to really pull heat from neighborhoods and to cool entire residential um, or commercial areas. So I would say, yeah, really thinking about kind of those um, emerging threats, what we do and don't know, and using a combination of um, creation of new knowledge and innovative and collaborative practices to address those threats um, in the best ways we can. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I wanna put my good friend Michael over here on notice. We are not gonna take questions right this second, but start raising your hands. I'm gonna ask our panelists one, one more thought and then we're gonna get around to you. So he's he's on the lookout for you. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, but you know, we do have a, an audience here that is a, a lot of corporate investors. Um, so I'm curious how each of you look at, you know, corporate involvement in restoration projects. Um, your practitioners, your people on the ground, you're in the research. So how do you collaborate best with, you know, other types of, of people who are interested in getting involved in these projects? And, and sort of what would you like this audience to know about, you know, the, the nitty gritty of your work? Pooja, I'll start with you. Um. Well, see, I'm with Carl on decarbonize. <laughs> I mean, that's the most important. Um, but in terms of corporates getting involved, um, I, think, I think what we need to do is marry the top-down perspective with the bottom-up. So in rooms like this, we're fabulous at understanding the bigger picture. Uh, we understand global commitments, national commitments. Uh, we've got a very top-down perspective when we meet in such rooms. Um, but when we really want something to work, what I think we need to do is, is sort of marry the top down and bottom up. Uh, and when you try the bottom up perspective, um, I'm guessing, Tilly, you've, you've probably seen that a lot, where there's just too many opinions and you need to make something work. Um, so it, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna work if we, we try to take uh, a very prescriptive approach where we go in with a plan and then expect everybody to make something happen. Um, instead, you're, you have to do the hard work of consulting with people on the ground and seeing what they want because really people on the ground, uh, you, know, you, know, you know the place you live, you know it the best. Um, people understand um, what the impact of climate change is. People understand what the impact of deforestation is. Um, they have so much knowledge. You need to incorporate that into your work. And I would say, let's not go for quick and easy solutions. We've seen a lot of these quick and easy tree planting <coughs> programs that have gone south, and they haven't produced the benefits they want. So we need to do it efficient, efficiently, um, you know, responsibly, and, and I think that we can see benefits um, for people, biodiversity, climate, um, but it really means that we, we need to do the hard work, not go for the quick and easies. 
solutions. Yeah, I think sometimes we get lost in the, you know, time is of the essence or checking a box, but really um, engaging uh, at that level with the people you're, you know, on the ground with who are going to be impacted by it is super important. Um, Tilly, let's go to you. Okay. How well, do you feel about <laughs> how, do, how do you feel about this issue? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that corporations have such an important role to play, and I think that having unusual bedfellows in the room is, is really important. And um, I guess one note, I guess plug I would put in is that, you know, there's restoration where we're trying to manually recreate these ecosystem services that the planet provides, and that is very expensive and very important in places. But there's also the um, keeping a place intact that nature's already created because it does the work the best. And so an example, I was hiking in the Muir Woods in California and talking to these people and they said, oh, we're doing stream restoration for the salmon because salmon lay their eggs in the river, they swim into the ocean and then they come back to lay their eggs where they were, where they were born. And I said, great, well, how many salmon have come back? And they said, well, this year we had three. And in Alaska, there's a place called Bristol Bay, which is under threat from some potential mines. And right now, every year, 50 to 60 million salmon return. And so trying to recreate that in a restoration basis is a challenge. So I think if you can do conservation and preservation first with innovative solutions, that's great. And then the on-the-ground restoration work is so important, and the community building and also, I think the storytelling, like the connecting people to place through stories and individual, because people really connect um, to it. And as um, Sarah also said, just, you know, it's, it's not just restoring the ecosystem, it's also restoring our mental health, our well being, because we all feel better when we're, when we're in nature, we're around water, we're in these parks, we have shade to be in, like all of these things are both good for the health of a planet and the health of everybody and the health of our businesses. So, mm -hmm. Great. Sarah? Yeah, well, I, I'll take a sort of hyper-local um, approach to answering this question and say there are so many opportunities for direct um, employee engagement in local projects in New York, but also all across the country and across the globe. Um, we have had such positive experiences inviting groups into the work that we do to plant trees, to build trails, to help us to take care of local wetlands. Um, those opportunities are meaningful for us as hosts and they're meaningful for the communities that we partner with, but they also provide a really deep connection, I think, um, to the parts of corporate missions that have to do with giving back to communities and to um, the environment because they really make that those concepts really tangible in a very um, shared way. So that would be one piece. I would say we also do a lot of work um, mentoring young people. We run a really robust workforce development and internship program and we are always looking for folks from the corporate sector who are interested in doing direct mentorship for young people, um, high school and college age and recent graduates who have an interest in the environment or trying to figure out kind of what that path should look like. Many of them come from um, backgrounds where a lot of the work that many of us do is not that accessible to them or just not that known to them. And so those are other ways that I think are really, really both personally meaningful, but also can have a really lasting impact over the course of um, the career of the, the people that we seek to match. Great. Well, let's go to some audience questions. Anybody have anything for our panelists? Hi, uh, Dr. Choksi, um, you mentioned the, the housing policy that led to a, a reduction in degradation of the forest. Can you describe the mechanism there? Was it intended for that purpose or was it a knock-on effect of something else? Um, so thanks for the question. Uh, it, so the policy was um, this governmental policy on, uh, the central governmental policy on building like a one-room house. Um, because you know it would it was more a well-being policy it had nothing to do with restoring forests the reason it had an impact is that a lot of the houses require good timber and that timber is is decent sized and and that's not saying there's any problem with that if you create your woodlots and you use it responsibly there's no problem at all 
Um, but this just happened to be an unintended consequence that we picked up through some remote sensing work. Wow. Um, so, so yeah. wow. All right, anyone else? I saw a couple hands earlier. Hi, I'm Nina Eisman from NASDAQ. So um, you all spoke a little bit about the connection, the importance of connection. I know a lot of corporations um, are, are interested in restoration projects and reforestation projects. You know, now we've got this whole specter of greenwashing hanging over our heads. You know, how do we tell the story without making it look like we're paying lip service to it? You know, how do we, how do we integrate these kinds of programs, whether it's in our, you know, our offset strategy, our carbon neutrality strategy, and, and do it in a, in a way that's really authentic without it, you know, being accused of, oh, you're just doing this for lip service. Great question. Who wants to tackle that? Thank you. Whoever wants to can, go first. Oh, okay, well, you can all well, chime in, but who wants to go first? I'll take go a stab yeah. at it. <laughs> well, thank you for the question. That is so important, and that is, I think that is a challenge that all corporations face. And, you know, back in the days of where people just started to get into the sustainability work, you always risk the, you know, this is just a greenwashing. But I think that if your company culture is authentic and if the strategies that you're building for your five year, three year, whatever plan, um, you know, actually have measurable effects, I think that you have something that you can go back and say, look, this is not greenwashing. We restored X number of acres. We created this many jobs. We did whatever the focus is for your organization. Um, I think that if you come at it from an authentic perspective and have the data to back it up, you know, people are going to greenwash anyways. But I think that, you know, like a friend um, is doing, he's doing all this work in Africa um, on some of these last great rivers, and he's sponsored by Rolex. And I think it's so cool to see his picture of the Rolex watch with the elephant behind him. And yeah, you can say it's greenwashing, but you know what? We need, we, it is not because we need each other. You know, the environmental groups, the people on the ground, the researchers, we all, and the corporations, we all need to be working together. And so I think at some point we all have to just be willing to kind of listen to the noise when we're out in the public and, and, and move forward with it, so. Anything else to add, Sarah? Yeah, I, I love that question. And I think um, just two additional thoughts to add to Tully's very smart response. I think one is we see a lot of benefit in um, establishing and maintaining partnerships with with the same groups and the same recipients of those um, philanthropic and ESG dollars, ha you, there's a much greater opportunity to really build relationships and to co-create project goals, which means you're not just sort of counting on a partner to feed you a set of metrics, but you're really thinking about what your corporate goals are and what those partners can offer. Um, the other thing that I think is emerging that I'm very interested in in the urban space is something that sort of blends together quantification of um, carbon and nature benefits, sort of speaking to um, or referencing some of what Carl spoke to with the ability to quantify some of those social and community benefits. So instead of it being just a credit or just a sort of feel good community project, we can talk about the sort of stacked benefits of carbon, nature, and also jobs created, or also um, increase, you know, doubling the number of people visiting a park, um, or increasing the number of, you know, families that have come out to volunteer. And that ability to, in some ways, kind of broaden the focus from just thinking about sort of those green metrics to thinking about a more holistic impact, I think actually have an opportunity to deepen the story we tell and to bring more authenticity to the way that we describe that impact. Great. Would you have anything to add? I think the only thing I'll add to that is um, open yourself up to scrutiny. I think there can be a lot of collaborations between um, people in the corporate world and, say, academics um, doing, trying their best to do unbiased research. Um, DMART, let the data be open. Um, let the data speak for itself. Um, so I would say the more you put out there and there's more transparency, perhaps that could address the, 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 you know, the greenwashing, the fear of greenwashing. Great. Sarah, Pooja, Tilly, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it.